If you want me to wear 37 pieces of flair like your uh, pretty boy over there, Brian, why don't you just make the minimum 37 pieces of flair? Hey, I'm Danny Boyd. So it seems like half my list of ideas of movies to end the year off with happen to have one thing in common. You see, we're putting the cover sheets on all TPS reports now before they go out. Did you see the memo about this? There were all these cult hits that totally bombed in theaters when they first came out. Films that went on for a turn at a second life, a boon of the heyday of movie rentals and physical media. Did you get that memo? Yeah, I got the memo. And I understand the policy, and the problem is just that I forgot the one time, and I've already taken care of it, so it's not even really a problem anymore. And without getting too heady about it, I do. that's I do. kind of what today's movie is all about. Okay, then I don't need 37 pieces of flair to do it. Giving the middle finger to conventional measures of success and taking a second chance at life somewhere else. Yeah, no, I, 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 I have the memo. I've got it. It's right. Hello, Phil. This is Office Space, and the year is 1999. I have the memo. I think Peter's trying to figure it all out. When I read the script, the thing that jumped out was uh, here's a guy that's like constantly searching for answers. I was asking what you were doing for lunch. Would you like to have lunch with me? Every time he finds one, he's sure that he's found, you know, the, the key to Nirvana. <laughs> what are you gonna do about money and bills and... You know, I've never really liked paying bills. I don't think I'm gonna do that either. <laughs> <laughs> and then when it doesn't work out, it, it doesn't deter him from, you know, throwing himself wholeheartedly into the next one, you know? So, Mike Judge, writer, director, Joanna's boss at Tchotchkes. People can get a cheeseburger anywhere. Donna gave his bike kids, too. Or else. Anyway, he hadn't made a live-action feature before Office Space. At the time, you'd most likely have known his name from his animation which will become more relevant in a moment. But as far as his debut went, Office Space barely broke even at the box office. Oh, and remember, next Friday is Hawaiian Shirt Day. Judge blamed the film's marketing campaign, specifically the poster. For home video, he managed to convince the studio to at least add Milton to it, the character played by Stephen Root. I set the building on fire. And it was there and on cable that it finally gained attention. I think because of the, the rise in DVDs right around that time, 99, 2000 was when DVDs had really peaked. Um, and since this doesn't, didn't do so great in theatrical release, it just found a life there. Just coffee. Okay. Sounds like a case of the Mondays. <laughs> I think a lot of that was Comedy Central, because uh, nobody saw it in the theaters, that's for sure. But it looks like I'm working. I do that for uh, probably another hour after lunch, too. I'd say in a given week, I probably only do about 15 minutes of real, actual work. So in August of 2001, two years after release, Comedy Central would run the movie to a tuned-in audience of 1.4 million people. Over the following year, it ended up getting shown another 35 times. The movie was relatable. The character is quotable and imitable. And it holds up. I really, uh, you know, if it's on, it's hard to, Gary, it's hard to switch it to. Gary channel. Cole. Oh. How many people have, have you ever had a boss like Gary Cole? Like, you know, did you get that memo, you know? Hello, Peter. What's happening? So, Peter, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Hi, Milton. Hi, Milton. Milton? Yeah. What's happening? I wanted to say, you. Milton, you know what would be great? Wait, no. When Gary Cole came in and read, I, I just, that, that was a good day because I, I was I was on the fence about making the movie. He came in and read, and I was just like, "Oh my God! If I can, if nothing else, if I get this guy on camera doing that character, that'll be worth it." My preparation was stealing everything that Mike Judge did. Ooh, ooh, mm -hmm. that's gonna be kind of tight on the overtime. Mm. Literally, I mean, that's all I that's did. It's based based on a uh, on an animation of his. Okay, so Milton was this cartoon series Judge had made and voiced in the early 90s that ran on SNL and MTV, preceding the side character from the movie. I used to be over by the window, and they moved me three times already this year. This year, and I used to be over by the window, and I could see the squirrels, and they were married. But then I didn't see a whole movie in just the Milton character. He's one of those types of characters where 
you kind of don't want to know what happens when he's at home, and you know, it's kind of funnier if you just get the tip of the iceberg. My, my stapler did not have to outfit the, the building on fire. Okay, well, that sounds, uh, sounds great. Uh, I'll talk to you later, all right? Bye. But all the characters invented for the film are great in their own way. Peter's Mir and Michael Bolton. That's me. So are you related to that singer guy? No. How am I supposed to live without you? Jennifer Aniston's Joanna. So you're stealing. John McKinley's Bob Number One, whose deliveries are one of a kind. What, what would you say you do here? Maybe my favorite, though. Hey, Peter, man. Check out Channel 9. Check out this chick. Damn it. Lawrence, can't you just pretend like we can't hear each other through the wall? We didn't have a lot of time to rehearse. He came that day and we rehearsed for a few minutes, half hour maybe before we shot. But in that time, came up with a lot of good stuff like the um, thing with he's got his own opener. Boredom, that's all right, I got it. I think the stuff about uh, take a look at my cousin, that was added. Well, you don't need a million dollars to do nothing, man. Take a look at my cousin. If he's broke, don't do shit. This scene is also essentially the setup for the whole thesis of the movie. How do you lead a life that wasn't governed by work? And could you? Do you guys ever wonder what would happen if you just stopped working? You'd be a street person. No, not necessarily, all right? Now think about it. If I just stopped going to work, all right, I could probably last a couple of months before I ran out of money. I could live off my credit cards for another four months after that. It takes at least six months to evict somebody, all right? And at least another two months after that before they come and physically remove me from the apartment, okay? So I could last over a year. Yeah, then you'd be a street person. Yeah, I, I mean, people will come up to me from time to time and say, you know, this movie and you were the reason that I quit my job and, and walked away from my livelihood. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, I'm always a little, I, I wait five seconds <laughs> before I say good for you because I don't know which way it went. <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah, and it's usually good or they wouldn't have, or they'd have just taken me out from yeah, behind. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Office space was weirdly impactful in other ways too, though. It colloquialized terms like PC load letter and TPS report. PC load letter? What the fuck does that mean? It inspired TGI Fridays to ditch their flair requirements. I, I have 15 pieces on. It indirectly got King of the Hill co-creator Greg Daniels to adapt The Office for American audiences after Judge turned it down, spawned countless references in pop culture, laid the foundation for a series of hip chat ads with Lumberg. Yeah. Funny or Die made this. So are you related to that singer guy? No. And, well, famously, it inspired Swingline to make red staplers. It, here, let me just go ahead and get that from you. Yeah. Mm. Great. Huh. Our high school guidance counselor used to ask us what you would do if you had a million dollars. Didn't have to work. And then invariably, whatever you'd say, that was supposed to be your career. So if you wanted to fix old cars, then you're supposed to be an auto mechanic. So what did you say? I never had an answer. Ron Livingston, who played Peter, made a great point once. He said, The movie resonated with so many people, not specifically because it was about working in a dreary office environment. You don't have to have had a job like that to connect with the film, or find it funny, or sweet, or satirical. It resonated with so many people, because fundamentally, it's about a guy who's miserable doing what he does, who gives himself permission to quit what's making him miserable, and goes off to do a thing that makes him happy, even when that thing is less lucrative or prestigious, even if that thing isn't going to be permanent. That's the beauty, that's the relatability inherent in office space. And it's the reason a small comedy from 1999 could go on to make an impact that resonates this much, this long, after it's made. I'm Danny Boyd. Happy New Year. We need to shut the curtain. Mark it. 
Hey everybody, today's video was brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all across the world. Mubi is fantastic. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, they've always got something new and amazing to discover. And that's because with Mubi, every film you see is hand-selected by a team of curators, real people, giving you access to the best of cinema at your fingertips, streaming anytime, anywhere. And right now in the US, Mubi is featuring a John Cassavetes double feature, the filmmaker touted as the godfather of independent cinema, and a close friend and frequent collaborator with one of my favorite actors of all time, Peter Falk. You can watch Husbands, or Gloria, or anything else streaming on Mubi for free with an extended 30-day trial if you go to mubi.com slash cinemasticks. Once again, that's M-U-B-I dot com slash cinemasticks for a whole month of great cinema for free.